I'm going to talk about relevance, quality, and efficiency. Everybody in this room knows more about ocular melanoma than me. Everything I know about ocular melanoma, I have learned this morning. So you're not going to learn anything about the condition in this talk. I'm going to be talking in general terms about what it is that makes sure that research is relevant, relevant to people who have decisions to make. People like you, people like clinicians, people about like commissioners who have to make decisions about what care to provide. I'm going to highlight some issues around quality and I'm going to talk about efficiency. So in Aberdeen, I'm leading an initiative that is aiming to improve the efficiency of trials. So trials is what I do. I design trials. And this is important because probably about seven years ago, a guy called Ian Chalmers and a colleague called Paul Glazew figured out that about 85% of all spending on biomedical research is wasted. So think of how much money is spent on biomedical research, and that's a very, very large number. I don't know what it is, it's huge. 85% of that is a very, very large number. These issues are extremely important because right now we are, as a community of scientists and trialists, wasting needlessly a lot of resource. So I think some of the ideas that I'm going to mention today, I hope, will help to reduce some of that. So if we think about efficiency and relevance and quality, there are at least two, there are other things you could think about. But a key one is to do with the science, scientific efficiency. What we want is to ask a relevant and important question and then choose the right design to answer that question. It sounds simple, sounds trivial, but it is not. It is entirely possible to make a mistake here and then burn your way through five million euros and five years and produce results which no one is interested in because of a problem with the design, a problem with the choice of outcome, a problem with the way you put participants into one part of the study or another. You can kill the usefulness of research before that research gets off of paper. And people do that. This is what we want to avoid. This is extremely important. It requires a lot of thought. And there is expertise that is essential for that, that is in this room. That's what relevance is about. People like you who have expertise in an area of this condition that somebody like me who designs trials has no expertise in. So your expertise is absolutely essential here. Absolutely key. People like me should never design a trial without people like you. Otherwise, we can spend our way through a huge amount of resource and waste everybody's time, money, and goodwill. Okay, so you have an absolutely central role in assuring scientific efficiency. Process efficiency is about how you then go about doing that piece of work. You can have a great question, a great design, but then make your piece of work very flabby. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on. So you do work which is good in terms of the result. It's relevant, people are interested in it. But the path you took was not efficient. You have wasted resource during that path, during that journey. And I'll talk about some ways in which that can happen. The research question, which I keep banging on about, is absolutely crucial. There's some um, high hegens, as we would say in Scotland, high hegens who've said, you know, you should be spending about a third or a half of all of the time you spend on your piece of research thinking through this. If you mess up here, you are stuffed. You really want to think through the research question. What is it we are trying to do? What is the gap in knowledge that our piece of work is going to help to fill? Whose decisions will be improved by the piece of work that we are thinking about? Has this question already been answered? Now, many of you will have heard about systematic reviews. All research should start, particularly trials, 
with systematic reviews. What do we already know in the literature about this question? Hoover up everything that we know from existing work before we blaze a trail doing something that people 10 years ago may already have answered. And there is clearly published work which shows that questions were answered a decade before people stopped doing trials on that question. Thousands of participants, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars spent answering a question that was answered a long time ago. Just think of what could have been done with those resources and with the goodwill of those participants. It was wasted. The first thing for particularly trials is a systematic review. What do we already know? Where are the gaps in research? Where can we make a real contribution so that we do not waste resource and we do not waste goodwill? Why bother? Why should we bother? Who, who will have the ability to make better decisions because of our piece of work? And then that leads you, having got your research question, to things like who should be in the trial? What should those people be contributing to the trial? Where should we be doing it? These sorts of things fall out of that careful process around the research question. And I'll show you a tool which can help with that too. The design is something that people like me can help with. A lot of these things are things that I cannot help with. That's what you can help with. And clinicians like the clinicians who have spoken earlier to this morning. Okay, so some bits I could do. There are bits that I absolutely categorically 100% cannot do. People like you have that expertise. This slide is gonna highlight a point. It's a guy called Doug Altman who was speaking at a research waste conference about one year ago exactly in Edinburgh. And he was talking about a systematic review that was looking at a marker, P53, as a marker, prognostic marker, for bladder cancer. And the people who did this review, they found 168 studies. Those studies had been done over a 10-year period and they had involved more than 10,000 patients. And when those reviewers pooled all of this work and asked, is P53 a marker of bladder cancer? What they concluded was, we have no idea. 10 years of work, more than 10,000 patients, 168 studies, and we shrug our shoulders because we have no idea. Shocking. Why? Well, there are 168 studies that have not produced an answer to that question. It is poor design, poor thinking with regard to their research questions, poor ways of allocating patients to one treatment perhaps or another. Poor design has meant that all of that goodwill and contribution and resource has not answered that question. It is deeply shocking. A review that I wrote a summary for, so I wasn't involved in the review, but I summarized it. This was looking at catheters in hospital, catheter number one versus catheter number two. There were 26 trials involving four and a half thousand patients. And at the end of that review, is catheter one better than catheter two? We have no idea. The quality of that research was so poor that we are unable to conclude whether catheter one is better than catheter two. Four and a half thousand people have contributed substantial amounts of their time to that work, and they have done that because they believed they were advancing science. And the people who designed those studies have not ensured that, that is the case. They have wasted goodwill. This is what we're hoping to avoid by thinking more carefully about this. This is a PhD student, or an ex-PhD student, she graduated last year, of mine called Kirsty Loudon. What she wanted to do was to develop a tool that could help trial teams think more carefully about the design of their trial. And to do so by thinking about who am I designing this trial for? Who are the people I want to inform with my results? What information can I provide to them to improve their decisions? And what can I do when designing my trial 
to ensure that those individuals are not forced to dismiss my trial as irrelevant to them and their patients. And she came up with a wheel. Now, we don't need to know the detail of this wheel, but what it is doing is here are some key design decisions that you will have to take in your trial. Things like, who should be in my trial? Where should that trial be done? What is the outcome that I should measure as my main outcome measure? These questions can make or break a trial. If up here, you are trying to run a trial that is gonna improve the decision making of general practitioners when they treat a patient with asthma, and the trial here is excluding whole rafts of patients with asthma, then straight away, you are not helping that person who's trying to make a decision about the treatment of his or her patients because you are excluding patients that he or she will see. Some of those patients should be in that trial. This brings it to the fore. Lots of trials that are actually dealing with decisions made in primary care choose to do those trials in hospitals because it's easier. And then those in primary care who are making these decisions would say, well, that's secondary care. This is not about me. They have different resources. They are different sorts of experts than we are. Dismiss. This sort of wheel helps think through those decisions. You get the team together and work through to make sure that yes, our trial design does reflect the needs of the people we are trying to help with our trial. It's a wheel and a four page crib sheet. If you read those four pages, you get most of the value out of that straight away. This is not a long course to figure it out. And there are funders, particularly in the States actually, that are now starting to use this to make sure that the trials they fund really do address the needs of the people we're expecting to gain from the trial. I have a particular gripe about outcomes, particularly the quantity of outcomes. I'm going to show you two graphs to highlight my point. Most trials define an outcome as the primary outcome, the most important <laughs> outcome that the trial will measure. It's generally the thing that defines the, the statistics of the trial the primary outcome. The trial team itself has defined this thing as the most important thing in our trial to measure. And then often they define some other outcomes which are called secondary outcomes. Other things that the trial team itself has defined to be of less importance. Not unimportant, but less important. And the question that we ask in our efficiency initiative up in Scotland is, what is the division of time allocated within our trial team to primary outcome to versus secondary? So this graph is 20 protocols, orange little bars at the bottom. We have, with an MSc student, calculated the time taken to collect primary outcome data. And I can see heads moving at the back trying to see these orange bars. And that failure to be able to see those orange bars is deliberate. It emphasizes my point. The reason these bars are small, these orange ones, this is the time spent on primary outcome measure, is because I want to, on my next slide, show you the time spent on secondary outcome measurement, which is this. So, what you see immediately is a lot of blue. The time spent collecting those blue things is the time that that trial team has dedicated to collecting outcomes that it itself has defined to be of less importance than the outcomes represented by the orange bars that are difficult to see from the back of the room. If you look at the ratio here, for some of these, the ratio of time spent primary versus secondary is over one to 30 for every hour spent collecting primary outcome data, they spend more than 30 hours on secondary outcome data. Overall, it's one to six. Now, the problem with that is that very often trials are not sufficiently well resourced to collect that data. These ratios and numbers and time is just about collecting the data. It is not about generating an electronic data management system to handle it 
or to get the data into that system, or to clean it, do quality assurance, or to extract the data for analysis. In my opinion, it often represents a lack of focus, and that that lack of focus can floor the trial. There's way too much work for the resources they have available, and that the resources they have are not directed at the thing that they themselves have defined as the most important outcome. It is directed at a collection of other things, which often, as far as the statistics are concerned, they do not have sufficient numbers of people in the trial to say much meaningful about them. And yet, that is where a vast, a large number of trials put the vast majority of their time. So we highlight this to ask, is that what you want to do? And this piece of work done in the States shows that that has a cost, as we might expect. It's a great piece of work done in the States. They looked at about 115 <coughs> protocols. These are drug protocols. And they categorized data into primary and secondary and key secondary. And they had something called non-core, outcomes that had nothing to do with the trial. And they found that 20% of all of the outcomes collected in those trials, 115 trials, were non-core. And they figured out that if you extrapolated that across the US, annually, those non-core outcomes were costing $3.7 billion every year. Think what we could do with $3.7 billion every year if we maintained our focus. Maybe those non-core things were used for something. Who knows? Very often, these data are not published in terms of the outcome data. If it's not out there in the public domain, it is not informing anybody's decisions. If it's not informing anybody's decisions, it's wasted. Right, I'm going to give you one example. I'm, I'm winding towards the end now. This trial forge idea, one of the, the key things it has as its starting point is we need more coordination and collaboration. So we can try and address some of these efficiency problems on our own, which is what's been happening forever. And people have been saying for at least half a century, we need to do something about efficiency in trials. But what we need to do is to be a bit more directed. Here are some key problems, and then work collaboratively to address them. And this is one example from trials linked to retention. Recruitment is hard. Once you have an individual involved in a trial, you want to make it as easy as possible for that individual to stay with the trial. And often as trialists, we do not do that. We make it actually quite hard for people to stay in the trial. <laughs> this group here, these are Aberdeen and Dundee, so it's a Scottish study. They use questionnaires, sent out questionnaires to collect trial outcome data. And what they did as one of the things to try and make it easier for people to return their questionnaire was the way they worded their cover letter. Now, it sounds trivial, but there's some theory they have used on the wording of the cover letter. It's a letter they were going to send anyway. It's as cheap as chips. But what they found was that by wording it in a particular way, it improved the response rates by about 6%. A small increase, but it was as cheap as chips. They were going to send the letter anyway. It cost them nothing in addition. Now, that's great, but it's not enough. We need to replicate this. We should never get excited about one study. We need to replicate it. So what we do within Trial Forge is, what ask other units and trialists, would you be interested in doing it? And these organizations have said, yes, we would. So what we weren't going to ask them to do is start evaluating that same intervention as a replication. And I think that level of collaboration, particularly in rare disease trials, is absolutely essential. You cannot do these things on your own, as well you know. But this degree of collaboration and coordination, what are the key questions where we should be directing the resource that we have available to us, is central. We really shouldn't be allowing or thinking that it's efficient to just hope that something interesting pops up and is dealt with by one group. I think it really does need coordination, which is why groups like this are important in setting priorities. I'm involved with one rare disease trial. It's a completely different topic. It's a neuromuscular condition. We had 
a meeting during the summer where we reflected on what we had learned from that trial, which is still ongoing. We're dealing with the data right now. And these are some of the key things. And while I was uh, thinking about this talk, uh, Catherine mentioned yesterday that you, um, Ocumel is interested in the future in, in funding research. Now, trials are very, very expensive. But there are things within this that I think even a funder with relatively modest amounts of money can make very, very useful contributions. The key finding from that rare disease trial that I'm involved with is that the outcome set was way too big. This is not a surprise to me because this is what we argued right from the start. It was difficult to get the clinical investigators on board with dramatically reducing the outcome set. That has cost us because we do not have the resources in that trial to fully collect that outcome set. So we're now, after an extension, we're doing months of data cleaning. This was entirely predictable. Indeed, we predicted it. It's a problem, it's a common problem, is that the data uh, collected, the outcome package, is way too big for the resources available. Now, something that an organization perhaps like Ocumel could do is work together with other stakeholders to figure out what is the outcome package that we should put into this trial. What are the key outcomes that we absolutely have to collect? And then anything outside that, we really need to make a very compelling case for collecting it if we don't have a lot of resource available. So deciding these core outcome sets, you have expertise in that. And that, I think, even relatively modest funding can move that along. We had logistical issues, practical issues, and I think that's a common problem in trials. People like me do not work clinically. We don't think about how we are going to move a bottle of blood from Nijmegen to Newcastle. Somebody needs to think about that. We didn't think about that sufficiently. And I think it's because we have the wrong people sometimes in the design team. It was an is an international study. There are differences in the health systems and in one country, we had a substantial problem being able to hire and pay the right type of staff. And that, again, is perhaps something that even relatively modest amounts of funding could do. Some pre-trial planning. What are the differences between the jurisdictions that we are thinking of involving in our trial? And what do we need to think about before we blaze ahead, hoping to recruit? If we'd have had some funding there, I think we'd have saved ourselves four months in terms of getting that center up and running. Uh, making it easy to take part, I think, is a problem for many, many trials. We put too much. It's very hard for investigators to not put stuff into the trial. If you have a large team, everybody has their own interests, and you end up with a sort of um, collection of people's interests. And I think we need to fight much harder to make sure that we do not put more into our trials and into our research than the research questions that we set out a long time ago justify. Because these, this hammers trials. And it also affects recruitment, and it definitely affects retention. The more you expect participants to do, the more difficult it is to keep those people interested. Although with, with this trial and rare diseases, I think there are some advantages. Um, with regard to retention. People are very, very motivated. And think, of course, how best to use your budget. We had a budget there of almost 4 million euros. It was not enough. We needed more to do the things that we had set in the design. So to summarize here, I always think about trials, but trials are hard work. All research is hard work. And it's hard work for everybody concerned, the, the team, the research team, and all of those participants who are giving of their goodwill and time and motivation. And everybody in that study is doing it for a variety of reasons, but one of them is we think we're advancing science. And as I showed earlier, that is not always the case because of poor decisions, poor design decisions, and not thinking about the consequences of decisions not looking for what we already know, not identifying outcomes, for example, that are of absolute key importance to key stakeholder groups such as you, means that a lot of time and money and goodwill can be wasted. What we need is 
planning, planning, and planning. Think very, very carefully. Take time right at the start to think through what is really important. What can we do with the sorts of resource we have available? What are the questions that we can answer? And focus our decision making on those. So at the end, we finish with a piece of work that is relevant to all of those people whose decisions you're hoping to improve, is of high quality so that some reviewer in the future is not forced to say, this is of very low quality, we can essentially ignore it. It's relevant, it's of high quality, and it's as efficient as you can make it because you've planned and you've planned and you've planned. Thank you very much.